Hey, hey Roger. How are you doing? I don't hear you. Oh, now I hear you, maybe. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry. Uh, it was my sounded, gr sounded great last night. Thank you. We're so happy to have you here. Yeah. So I'm going to hand it off to you, and um, you can just share your screen and uh, do your thing, and we can't wait. Where, where is everybody? That I don't. Are they? I only see John and you, but. Yeah, so so it's a webinar format. So uh, we have sixty people so far here. They're just, oh wow, they're not visible, but but uh, people can say hi in the chat if you want to say hi to Roger. <laughs> uh, people are here, and more people are coming in. So That's you, cool. at the bottom, you can see the participants button, and if you click on that, you can actually see who's here. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, and here's the chat. Oh, lots of people saying hi. So. <laughs> All right, I'll let you take it away. All right, awesome. Thanks, thanks, Danielle. I'll share my screen here. Hello, everyone. It's terrific to be here with you. And uh, as you saw on the uh, schedule, I've entitled my little lecture, Why on Earth? Oops. Do we call it the French horn? And uh, I thought it would be fun to kind of talk about some things other than music and technique, obviously the stuff we, we usually talk about, which is the most important thing, but kind of the scientific side of the horn and the cultural side and, and the historic side are also really, really interesting to me. And this question I'm posing rhetorically, it's, it's sort of a teaser question and we'll, we'll try to answer it maybe a little bit, but it, it probably can't ultimately be answered, but it is a very interesting subject. So um, let's just start out right with some scientific stuff here. Here we have the old harmonic series and I've numbered them as you sometimes see it this way. And uh, it, it, for years and years, I didn't really, really understand the significance of the numbers. It's not that just we're counting them up and this is the order they go, but these numbers are utterly fascinating to me because they represent exact multiples of that first frequency, which we call the uh, fundamental. So the second harmonic, I don't even see my pointer, is exactly an octave above. Then skipping to the fourth harmonic, two octaves above four to one, the next octave eight to one. And finally, when we play our high C on the F horn or any, any horn really, uh, it's the 16th harmonic and it's vibrating 16 times faster than that fundamental. And of course, there's all these other relationships in there too. You've got the perfect fifth, which is a three to two ratio. You've got the perfect fourth, which is a three to four ratio. And, you know, my teacher, Chris Luba, who many of you know, longtime uh, guru in Seattle and, and taught at University of Washington and also at Western Washington, just passed away last year. He was very big on just intonation and getting these perfect intervals. And he would talk about these ratios and I, I never really understood what he meant. Here's a chart that's showing basically what's going on. That top, uh, one is the fundamental, that's the wave that's going all the way through your horn and back and vibrating at the lowest frequency. And then the next one is vibrating twice as fast. Next one, three times as fast, four times, five times. And again, it's just, it's amazing to me because so many things in math are not even numbers, you know. Pi is not exactly three times uh, the, the circumference of, is, uh, of the of the uh, diameter, it's 3.1.4 or whatever, you know, it's this fact that it's exact even numbers, it fascinates me. And we could express that in a, a chart here. So basically this is the harmonic series. The first one's your fundamental times whatever frequency, F means the frequency, and the next one is two times. So let's, let's put this into a concrete example. I'll just take the uh, lowest note, and I'll just multiply it by 100 and we'll say this is an exact frequency 
And it just so happens, this is a complete coincidence, that 100 is a, a, roughly a concert F, uh, especially if it was a, a lower pitched F, like a A435F or something. So that just, just happened to be, but it doesn't matter. You can take any pitch. It's just that the math comes out very, very clean on this if we, if we multiply it by 100. So again, it, it's just these, these exact multiples and most of them correspond to what we consider, you know, in tune intonation. Uh, for years, I've wondered why are there 12 tones in a scale? Is that just completely arbitrary? Could we just as easily make it 13 tones or 14 tones? And no, there, there's quite a bit of just natural uh, physics and natural logic involved in it. So you see most of these notes line up. The seventh harmonic obviously is flat. The eleventh harmonic is that note between F and F sharp, and then the thirteenth harmonic is a very strange uh, A flat. Is not really an A flat. And seven, eleven, and thirteen are the harmonics that uh, natural horn players worry about the most. You have to correct the seventh by opening your hand quite a bit. And you, you use the 11th harmonic both for F and for F sharp. So again, really fascinating. Now, let me show you something here. I have a, a horn that I've brought out. This is one of my natural horns. And uh, I'll just tell you that I, I've got about 10 feet of tube here. So from the mouth pipe to the bell. and. Uh, I was explaining to you a minute ago that the wave that we create when we play the fundamental goes all the way down to the end of the horn and then back. It's a round trip journey. So the length of the wave that we're creating is 20 feet long. And there's some sort of interesting math we can use. If we divide that 20 into 1100, okay. I'll tell you in a minute why we're using 1100. We come up with 55. Any guesses what the 1100 is about? I don't know if I can see any questions here. Yeah. 1100 is approximate average of the speed of sound when it's going through air. And of course, it depends on the temperature and, and a few other conditions. Sound travels way, way faster through water and also through solid objects. But through air, it's about 1100. We divide that by the 20 feet, which again was the distance down and back the horn. We come up with 55. Well, 55 is an interesting number. We were talking about how every octave is, is exactly double the previous frequency. So 55, 110, 220. 440, we can conclude, not even playing a note on this horn, that it's an A horn and the fundamental is there. 55, 110, 220, and finally 440. Okay, so it's all very, very simple math. I just find this, this stuff incredibly fascinating. And I hope you'll explore the harmonic series a little bit more. It's just it's just an amazing thing because it's it's in, on all instruments, not just wind instruments. Obviously, strings have harmonics, and uh, the thing that we should know about the horn is that to create a harmonic series, actually any brass instrument, we need a tapering form. We need a form that expands. For example, I'll move right on to my next section here. Along with my, uh, okay, maybe you recognize this is the uh, African antelope, a kudu, and has utterly fascinating horns. You know this crazy spiral thing. They, they get huge. They're like the the, the male bucks. They're like uh, three feet long or something. They're utterly enormous. You can see we've got that expanding form from the tip. And therefore you can play these like horns. And here I have a little demo for you.
Okay, so obviously, um, this is like the primeval horn. This is this is similar to maybe the first horn that was ever played. If, if you went back ten thousand years, uh, you had a time machine that could take you back to northern Europe or actually anywhere in Europe or maybe Africa, but uh, we don't know. And you you saw an animal with horns similar to that, that kudu and you met someone and you pointed out, hey, that's a horn. <laughs> they would actually understand you because linguists tell us that horn is one of the oldest words in any language. It's not just in English language or Germanic languages, but the so-called proto-Indo-European languages. It's an incredibly old word. And then further south, they instead of horn, they would say corn, corno, cornu, uh, but it's, it's basically the same sound. So you heard this, this very talented player and he, he played the kudu horn and it, I have one, I haven't actually converted to a horn yet. It, it's a little bit more difficult than I thought it was gonna be, but um, he played a perfect fifth and if you could actually hear a grace note that sounded like the fundamental. So on this, horn, which looks like it's about three and a half feet long, he's able to get harmonics one, two, and three, and maybe even higher. Now, if we had the chops to do it, you could probably play way up into the, the higher harmonics. What will make a horn uh, play in one range or another is depends on the interface between length of the horn and our chops, basically. So, uh, you know, if the horn were way too big, human chops wouldn't be able to do it. And if the horn's way too small, the same thing. But when, when it reaches that happy medium, uh, that's, that's where we can play horns. And anthropologists suggest that uh, the earliest horns were just used kind of like megaphones. In other words, uh, you were just shouting through it and getting that kind of spooky voice you get when you talk through a megaphone. And then someone at some point, and my, uh, Suspicion is it was a kid, maybe. A kid was goofing around with the adult's horn megaphone and just buzzed their lips one day. <laughs> and suddenly this utterly magical thing happened. The, you know, the horn didn't just talk, it, it suddenly resonated and spoke music. So uh, clearly horns are some of the oldest instruments. We haven't found like prehistoric horns the way we found prehistoric flutes, although they did find a conch shell recently that had some very specific holes drilled into it. So it was almost like, uh, you know, tonal venting holes to get different pitches on this conch shell. So here's a, another kind of horn. This uh, called the olifant, made out of uh, ivory from elephants tusks. These were very, very popular in the Middle Ages. Uh, they were presented to high ranking people. They took incredible amount of labor to craft as you can imagine. And these are found in museums. Here's an Indian horn. I'm just gonna show you a few random kind of horns from around the world, actually not very many at all, but, but just to make the point that the horns are a universal instrument, okay? There's Amazon tribes that would make horns out of bark. Uh, there's in the Tibet, it's a little gruesome, but they, they make a what's called a thigh bone trumpet out of a large person. Usually they like a, a large bone and they, they play these for funerals and for ceremonial purposes. Here's of course the alp horn. I just like this shot, the Matterhorns in the background there. But let's go to a, a really early horn that looks a little bit like our instrument in the sense that it's curved and wraps around. This is a, a Scandinavian lure, L-U-R. Um, the Vikings had these, apparently they used them on ships to signal from shore to uh, the ship and uh, they would, they come in pairs usually. There were left-handed and right-handed versions of them. 
So they're, and they're found buried in bogs. I think they found a few hundred of these all over Europe. And I've been told there's really only one good note on this instrument, but it's, it's a truly amazing note. It is a truly resonant note. And that's what they would use. And supposedly you could hear this, if the sea was calm, you could hear it up to 12 miles away. Okay, here we have a Broman cornu, and I actually have one here. This, this thing arrived. This thing arrived in the mail <laughs> the other day. I was fascinated by them. They make them for uh, reenactors, like Roman soldier reenactors, because you would need one of these at the front of the legion to uh, keep the troops in order. Uh, well, I'll just try playing a note on it. It's, it's really kind of a gross sound. It's, it's sort of trumpet-like. Uh, so when we talk about these old instruments, let's face it, uh, we're not talking about anything characteristic of the modern horn sound. We're just talking about instruments, especially now we're into brass instruments that are uh, curved, you know, there were plenty of straight instruments. There were trumpets in, you know, there's a trumpet in King Tut's tomb. So trumpets really have us beat uh, in terms of having a, a real definite lineage, but these curved horn objects appear from time to time. Here's, here's the cornu, uh, here's a picture of it. Here's a group of them. This is on the famous Trajan's column in Rome. If you've ever been there, this is carved into the side of it. I'd like to see an original cornu. I, I have a feeling this reproduction is, is, is slightly bogus, but uh, I'll have, I haven't played it enough. So basically, uh, yeah, we've got this Roman horn and they were very, very adept. Uh, making brass instruments out of sheets of metal. They knew how to make tubing and made a uh, cylindrical tubing and conical tubing. Unfortunately, when the Roman empire fell in about the fourth century, end of the fourth century, that art of working with brass was totally lost. And for the next, I don't know, eight, 900 years, they had to basically rediscover it at the beginning of the Renaissance. So we, we reverted back to uh, real simple horns, animal horns or, or simple ceramic or maybe metal horns, but uh, very simple. They call these dem and loon horns. They're kind of a half moon shape. This is from some tapestry in the middle ages. Perhaps you know about the legend of St. Hubert who's the patron saint of horn players. He was a hunter and just doing his own thing, not a very religious guy, uh, but had his a vision in the forest where he saw a stag with the crucifix between it. Here's another form. Oh, excuse me, that's not it. I'm missing, sorry. I'm missing one of my, oh, there it is. This, uh, is a more modern version of it. And I like the, the glowing crucifix there. It's really cool. So anyway, that's why St. Hubert is our patron saint. He was a hunter with, with his horn. Um, here's an interesting medieval drawing. And at the top is actually a very primitive kind of musical notation. And the people that have uh, tried to transcribe this feel that those white squares are fast notes and the dark squares are slower notes. So if you can imagine him playing this call, he's playing something like ta 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 So it's fascinating to me that that rhythm ta 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 ta, which is recycled through all hunting music and ends up, you know, in the third movement of all of Mozart's concerti. 
We find it, you know, hundreds of years before. So the horn throughout all that time that the many of the dark ages, the medieval period was was used, you know, as a signaling instrument in the hunt. We don't really know exactly what the calls were. They were probably pretty simple because again, you did not have the higher harmonics. You just had a handful of tones on this instrument. Uh, so we'll get to about the year 1500. We come across this really, really interesting woodcut by Brandt. And he was illustrating the works of Virgil, you know, the Roman poet. And he has this curled instrument, which, you know, if you really tried to reproduce that, it would probably be in like E flat or something. It'd probably be a very low horn. And of course, we don't know about any horns that early. And th this particular drawing has caused the author uh, of this book, The French Horn by Morley Pegg, quite a bit of consternation because it, it seems to imply that there, this instrument existed about at least 100 or 150 years before we know it to be. My theory on this is that he was actually trying to uh, reproduce that cornu that we saw earlier. You know, something like that. He just didn't know what it looked like. And so he, he created this horn and we don't really think this horn existed. Uh, but, you know, we never know. Some people do think it did exist and th that these instruments have just completely disappeared and they'll never be found. It's, it's, it's a great mystery. So here we get to some uh, early drawings from the Re Renaissance. And now you're starting to see an interesting horn, the one on the left there, which he calls the Acher horn. It's probably made of earthenware or porcelain, some kind of ceramic horn. And the Jaeger horn, again, another one of those half moon horns. Then we see on the right, what's called the Huntsman's trumpet, the Jaeger trumpet. Uh, now we're starting to see something that really looks somewhat horn-like. And now we see a few more of these are even more elaborate. This is a uh, drawing by Holler. He's got two types of horns, the half moon horns, and then the, the curled horns, the so-called helical horns. Here's one, here's a photograph of one from 1590. It's in G, that would be the G, an octave and a step above our F horn. And uh, at some point, this horn or something very similar to it became quite, quite common, especially in France. And they called it, it's on the, the top left there, uh, le corps à plusieurs tours, which means a horn with several turns, okay? And that's to distinguish it from this one in the middle, which they just called a tromp. And that was a horn with, with one turn. And it, again, pretty small instrument. So uh, you're gonna get some of the higher harmonics, but not too many. It's, it's still a very high pitched instrument. But just a little bit later, 1615, we have this interesting drawing from Bracelli in Rome, uh, a much bigger tromp. And it, again, it's only got one turn, but this, this horn probably is in a low enough key. You can start getting some higher harmonics. Uh, as you can see, he didn't really know how horns were held or maybe they didn't know how they were held. This is a great mystery. We'll talk about this in a second. Uh, how were the horns held in those days? So next, is this horn by Stark from Nuremberg in 1667. And as it says here, it's the oldest existing horn. This is what's fascinating. This horn uh, is in the key of F alto. So exactly an octave higher than our current horn. Or if you want, you can say it's in the same pitch as a uh, descant F. Um, now, why don't we have some of these earlier horns? There's a lot of good reasons. One, they used a, a metal uh, called calamine. It was a type of brass that had a lot of zinc in it and it, it tends to uh, corrode very easily and it tends to just basically rot over time. Now, we promised to answer the question at the beginning, you know, why is it called a French horn? 
and I'm showing you an example of a horn. The last one was from Italy. This one's from Germany. Clearly these horns were all over Europe and we haven't actually even found them in France. Um, there's a reason for that, we'll get to that. But um, it, it's really interesting to me that this, this horn was starting to gain some currencies. Here's another horn, very similar size, probably in high pitch. So what happened? What happened that caused this instrument to be dubbed the French horn? And that brings us to, and you knew this was coming, the famous Count Spork, Anton von Spork. And this guy, Wikipedia calls him one of the most influential intellectual figures in Central Europe in the uh, 18th century. Now, he was a friend of Bach and he was an incredible patron of the arts all his life. But when he was 18 years old, he went on his grand tour of Europe and of course stopped at the court of Versailles and something impressed him incredibly there. That was the hunt, the royal hunt at Versailles. And I'll zoom in. You can see this uh, guy on a horse down here in the lower left. You can barely see he's playing a horn. I'll zoom in on that. So you can see something happened to the horns that we saw a minute ago, which were much smaller. This, this horn is huge. It's got a, an incredible uh, radius. And this became basically the horn that the French were using around that time. Here's another shot of it. Again, really huge open horns. They call them hoop horns. And some of them are in very low keys, as low as B natural or C basso below our F horn. Um, here's another shot. By now it's, it's gotten over to Germany. So what did Count Spork here? And this is what a lot of people have conjectured about. He clearly heard something that was different than those high pitched horns that were being used in Germany. And we don't really know what he heard, but it's, quite likely that he heard a horn that was in a lower key, possibly in D, which has been the official key for the hunting horn or the trompe de chasse ever since 1720. So it could have been the key even before that. Uh, the trompe changed at some point and became much more compact. And a lot of you have probably heard the trompe de chasse in concert, but let me just play you a little bit to remind you has a very distinctive sound. Okay. okay they're, they're judging him, it's a contest. Okay, so uh, really a fascinating sound. We don't know if this is exactly what Count Spork heard or if this tradition has evolved considerably since that time. Uh, I'm undoubtedly has, although it's, it's been kind of frozen in time for, for quite a while. But this horn, I have one here. I, I found it in an antique shop in North Carolina. It was online. We got it for a couple, couple hundred bucks, 300 bucks. You can find these things. They're very handy. They came up with a perfect size. You can go right over your shoulder like this. And it fits a lot better than those, those open loop ones. I think that was the idea. Uh, if you get one, you're not going to be able to use your regular mouthpiece. 
because this, this open is extremely small. And if you use a true trump rim, uh, well, good luck with that. It's, they're unbelievably skinny. I've got my own rim on here, so I'm definitely cheating. <laughs> Uh, I don't want to insult any real trump players by making an inverted parody of it because I, I can't do it. It's it's a it's a completely different technique from what we do as as concert horn players. Here's what it would sound like with a group of them. Maybe maybe this is what Count Spork heard something along these lines. Okay, so whatever he heard, he heard something he'd never heard in his native land of Bohemia. Uh, so the story goes, and we just have to take journalists and chronicles, chroniclers word for this, that he left two of his men, his uh, valets, part of his touring party to stay and learn how to play the tromp or play the corps de chasse as it was known then. And uh, then he brought them back after they'd mastered, he brought them back to Bohemia. And if this story is true, and again, we don't have any reason to doubt it, he basically single-handedly started the whole tradition of horn playing, serious concert horn playing. Because shortly after that, uh, about around the turn of the century, uh, 1700 or so, composers started adding the horn or some horn like this to the orchestra. Here's a picture of what the tromp became when it was scaled down a little bit, kind of like the one I showed you. And at this point, there, there seems to be quite a bit of confusion as to how the instruments held. Now, they're, they're not putting their hand in the bell or doing any kind of uh, modification of the tone that way. Here's a uh, lady holding it, kind of cradling it in an interesting way. The classic position on the left there where you, you hold it with one arm, that seems to be a theme here. Both these guys on the right are doing it as well. These horns that are mirrored, that was a thing back then. You'd build the horn uh, left-handed and right-handed and you'd, you'd always play duets facing each other like this. They just liked the way it looked better. Now, what about all these pictures where they're holding the horn straight up? This is a real common theme. I'll show you a few more. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried playing a horn straight up. It's <laughs> not exactly ergonomic. Now, this final picture kind of gives a big clue whether that position was actually real or not. Take a look at the double bass player in the front, or maybe it's a cello, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Clearly that is not the way you play that instrument in the slightest. So it's, it's entirely possible that these pictures of horn players holding their instrument straight up like this, uh, it's entirely possible it's just to show the instrument and be a little bit theatrical. And it's also possible the artists never really saw what it looked like because concerts were a rare event back then. And the average public did not get into concerts. It was strictly for the nobility and the upper class. Here's a, another picture, horn player up on the, on the left there. Again, they didn't seem to put their hand in the bell, at least in this early period. Here he, he's holding the horn down but it's uh, again, one-handed. This one's kind of interesting. He's holding the music in his left hand and the horn in his right. So that brings us to the Baroque period. And uh, 
I thought we'd spend a moment talking about uh, Johann Sebastian Bach because again, he was a friend of Count Spork's and it's possible that Spork inter influenced him to use horns in his music, but Hi uh, Bach certainly did and wrote some of the most difficult horn parts we know about. Uh, one that comes to mind, of course, is the first Brandenburg Concerto. And maybe you've wondered about the first two measures of the piece have this fanfare in the horns that don't seem to relate to anything um, melodic or motivic in the movement. Second horn starts out and then the first horn answers. Excuse me. Um, so uh, what was that all about? According to Horst Fitzpatrick, who wrote this marvelous book here, some of you have probably seen, Bach was actually quoting a very well-known hunting uh, call at that time. And Fitzpatrick thinks it probably would have been played more triplely like this. <laughs> you know, you heard how those horn players kind of stylized everything in kind of a triplety way. He thinks that's how it would have been played. But in any case, Bach was making a little inside reference for his prints that he was sending it to. He sent the Brandenburgs to the Margrave of Brandenburg trying to get uh, a job there and ended up not getting a job. But the piece was performed, we know that. Um, and Bach was incredibly adventuresome with his horn writing. I mean, a lot of composers were Telemann and Scarlatti and Handel, but Bach really pushed it to the limit. Here's one of his uh, scores that's in his own handwriting. It's just the horn part. Maybe some of you recognize this is Cantata 14, the aria. And okay, you can see on the third line, it looks like it's getting a little bit high there. We're going up to a high D. Um, the bad news is that this part is in B flat alto. So that's not a high D, that's actually a high G above high C. And if you've ever tried to play this, you wanna know what is going on? How could horn players play these parts? I think the answer is that they weren't always played by horn players. Here's a picture of Bach's famous first trumpet, uh, Gottfried Reich. And he's holding a trumpet in his hand. It looks like a horn, but you can see it's a trumpet mouthpiece. And he's actually holding in his other hand this little fanfare that he wrote, presumably. And it's the only piece of music we know that he wrote. And it just happens to be the one they use for the theme of the TV show CBS Sunday Morning with Wynton Marcellus playing it right at the moment, uh, that famous uh, fanfare. So it's entirely possible that, that Reich or others, there were the village musicians that were tr trumpet players played these parts. I bought this Baroque horn. Uh, it's a Rick Serafinov Haas model horn. I bought it partly because I had this obsession with trying to prove this theory. So I had my mouthpiece maker, who you guys might know, Jim Weaver, terrific Seattle mouthpiece maker. He had to make me a uh, horn mouthpiece with a trumpet rim. And I took this horn to some trumpet players and then I showed them that music that I just showed you. And I said, can you play this uh, part? And they had absolutely no trouble with it at all. So trumpet chops are designed for those super high notes. Nevertheless, some horn players have figured out how to do it. I'll just play a little of this so you can hear it. This is Andrew Clark playing. Uh, Got to get to the spot here. Here we go. Sorry. Thank you. 
So truly some amazing playing there, especially because he's playing it on a natural instrument. Um, but again, Bach wasn't, uh, didn't shy away from those super high notes, although a lot of his horn writing, for example, in the Brandenburg uh, and some of the hunting cantatas, he wrote it in F quite a bit, probably for an instrument that was a fixed pitch instrument like the hunting horn, but pitched in F or pitched in D. Um, and they pretty much tops out at high C in a lot of his writing. But uh, there's several excerpt books. There's a new one, a new collection of excerpt books edited by Edward Tarr. And if you can afford it, I, I recommend getting them because they have all the Bach uh, horn parts in them. They're really, really some amazing stuff. Um, so about this time, around 1700, uh, we see that the horns being turned away from this natural uh, or this kind of cultural folk hunting horn into a concert instrument. And to avoid the problem of having to make a new horn for every key, crooks were invented. Now they've probably been around for trumpets for quite a while, but according to Fitzpatrick, and I think he's, he's probably accurate. Some people dispute it, but he found a receipt for some horns made around 1700 uh, by the Leichnam Schneider brothers. And uh, this, these were a group of uh, the two brothers that lived in Vienna. And they're apparently amazing workmen. They kind of made the horn a little bit more compact, made the bell a little bit bigger, softened the sound a little bit and invented crooks. So. Uh, Again, getting back to, to my Baroque horn, this is one which would be very similar to the ones that they made. The, you know, the bell is not as big as a modern bell by any means. It's about the size of a trombone maybe, but it's, it's a lot bigger than those earlier horns. And with the crooks, we can now put the horn into any key. And that, that obviously was a huge benefit. When they were going through Reich's estate, after he died, they found, a, it says in the will, they found a vault horn with crooks. So um, writing in the key of F or D or C perhaps, cantata 65 is, is in C basso. Uh, and then there's there's some in A, High, uh, Handel wrote some for in G, uh, Bach wrote in B flat alto as we, as we just heard. So this point the, the horn's getting very, very versatile. I'd like to point out another instrument. Now we have absolutely no living specimens of this or surviving specimens. This is the corno da Tarasi. It's a slide horn, okay? So that at the bottom there, that li literally slides like a trombone and you would play this somewhat like an alto trombone. There's some people that have mastered a version of this instrument. I think Annika Scott has, has just put out a recording where she's playing on the a modern version of this. Again, we don't know what the real corno tarasi looked like because uh, we don't have any examples, but it probably looks something like this. So uh, moving on here, I just want to talk about the classical horn because that's the horn that we're really kind of used to when we see period performances. Uh, talking about the horn, again, this is a, a French model, Hallery model that uh, Rick Sarafinoff made. And I'll, I'll, I'll get out my E flat crook. By the time we get to Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven, the horn had kind of settled down into these lower keys. They felt that the lower keys really put the horn's best foot forward, it sounded the best in those lower keys, F, E, E flat, D. So. I'm using a little bit of hand 
technique. This is popularly credited to Hompel in around 1750. They say, well, he invented hand horn technique. Probably horn players were using it much earlier than that. We don't know when. They didn't write about it, so we don't know. We don't know if, if box horn players figured out at some point, hey, if we put the hand in the bell, we can fix the, the 11th harmonic and the 13th harmonic. Uh, we, it's possible even trumpet players played those, those curled trumpets with their hand in the bell. It's, it's, it's just a great mystery. Uh, the current thinking is that they didn't use much hand horn in those Baroque periods. So now when we hear uh, so-called authentic performances, a lot of times we hear them when they're using these tonal uh, venting node holes. Okay, you, you hold it down most of the time, but then you lift it up and it raises the pitch of the horn by a fourth and it allows you to play those notes in tune. Although they do have quite a bit a lower volume level, at least I, I can tell when I listen to recordings whenever they're using that because the note suddenly gets much softer. So those are not authentic. They're basically a compromise to allow uh, conductors to not be upset about gamey intonation. But another school of thought says, hey, why don't we just leave those partials where they are and see if the audience really cares that much. And there's this, there's a great recording of the, I think the water music or the Royal Fireworks music at the proms, if you can Google that. And there's this enormous retinue of horn players. There must be eight or 12 of them holding the horn high and just, just playing the intonation right where it lies. And possibly they used their chops to bend the notes a little bit. If the horn back then was a little less centered than it is now. And of course, if you don't have your hand in the bell that automatically uncenters things in the high range. Then you could lip the note low for the F natural. You could lip it high for the F sharp. We, we really don't know what they did. Um, but we're now we're into the golden age of horn making. And at this point, they were trying to come up with different solutions. This is out of the Morley Pegg book, um, the plate of instruments. The, the top is uh, what's called an invention horn, and it's got two different uh, lead pipes on it. The others are they call core solo, which is a, a crooked horn, but the crook is not at the end at the mouthpiece, the so-called terminal crook. The crook is the tuning slide, basically. And I think they found that this horn was really a much more stable. For one thing, you know, every time you add uh, couplers and crooks, the horn becomes further and further away from you and it becomes a little bit more rickety. This, this horn's very solid. The disadvantage is it can't play those higher keys as much. They, they pitch it in G or F and then they can put in slides to make it go lower, but not so much higher. So that's why they call it the core solo because those were the great solo keys, F, E, E flat, and D. At some point they thought, well, hey, why don't we just put all the crooks on there and then we'll just figure out a way to get from one crook to another. And these are all different attempts at that solution. Uh, this one here, I think has this big slide you can kind of move to access one of those crooks. This one has sort of a valve, but it's just a valve you would, you do, you'd have a setting for a crook and you just leave it. You'd still be using hand horn technique in that key. This one at the top has a whole bunch of lead Pipes. In fact, it's just, you can see it's like a, you know, Gatlin gun or something. It's, it's really crazy. You change horns by changing your mouthpiece into a different lead pipe. This one doesn't even look like a horn and it's got a slide. So I, it's, it's, it's a very disturbing looking instrument to me. Um, but anyway, that, that was a short lived period that, you know, adding all the extra weight and not really getting much benefit, except that you didn't have to you know, physically get out your crooks and change it. And so you could change much faster, but it, it, it had some, a lot of disadvantages. So finally, we come up to the invention of valves around 1815 or so. And uh, the earliest valves were, were these valve sections. You could just kind of plug and play. You'd, you'd interchange them in your natural horn, you'd add this section of tubing. I wish I had a real horn to, to demonstrate that to you, but um, 
and when you think about it, two valves, two valves is all you need for, you know, 95% of what you're playing. You, the only time you really need the third valve is for A flat in the staff. You can play that A flat first valve. It's just going to be a little bit flat because it's the seventh harmonic. And then the, the A flat below middle C, you could just play one and two and, and close a little bit. So uh, I think they were very, very concerned about weight back then. And they were concerned not over burden the horn, which we've, we've, we've definitely got away from that concept. So I'm going to shift gears and show you, probably most of you play this third act of Lohengrin of Wagner. The first time I saw this, I couldn't figure out what was going on. He's, he's in G for a measure and a half. Then he's in E for, you know, four or five bars. Then he's back to G, then E, then goes into D at the end of the second line. I thought this this makes absolutely no sense. There's no time to change crooks. Why are, why are we doing this? And the answer is, if you go back to those other horns, they weren't thinking about making a horn completely chromatic, so you would finger every note differently as you move through the scale. They were thinking about okay, now I'm in G. I'm going to use most of the notes open on the G harmonic series, and then a few hand stop notes, and then. In the E horn, same thing, a few hand stop notes, but mostly open. So they were basically treating valves in the earliest days just like instant crook changes, okay? And this period didn't last very long because Wagner only wrote this way a little bit. And, and it, I think quickly they realized, you know, we, you know, we don't need to uh, necessarily play hand horn. If we have these valves, we can kind of turn this into a chromatic instrument. And, uh, I saw Jeff Snedeker's doing this great lecture on the transition in France from natural horn to uh, valve horn. That, that was, took a, a very, very long time. The French were incredibly resistant to the idea. They thought something had been lost. And actually quite a few people thought that. Brahms was a holdout. He didn't like the valve horn. He, he gave it the ultimate uh, insult by calling it a brass viola. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, low blow. Um, and uh, most of the valves in, that were being used in Germany, valved instruments were being used like in military bands where it was very handy for the horn to suddenly be chromatic. And they added valves, of course, to trumpets and trombones were already completely chromatic. But uh, it was a long reckoning to, to move into the valve horn. Of course, Schumann was the first one to really write some solo music for valve horn. We heard that great concert she took last night. Um, we're running out of time here, so I'm just gonna go through a couple more horns. This is one of my favorite horns, even though I don't own one. This is obviously the, the Wiener horn, the Vienna horn. And it's, it's, it's a fascinating hybrid instrument because it's got the terminal crook, just like the natural horns. It's got the, the big, somewhat big throated bell that was typical of, of Germanic horns versus French horns, French made horns. Here's a close up of the valve. It's a double piston valve. Uh, then we get into the mid 19th century where a lot of single horns might've looked something like this. This is an old Krushby horn. Looks like they might have an E flat crook in it. They didn't necessarily play in F in those days, they played in different keys. And if you could adjust the valve slides to compensate for that extra distance, you could make it an E flat horn, just like, like we can today. Um, here's a fascinating horn. This is apparently the very first double horn, also invented by Kirsby. And you can see it's got two change valves, one there and one there. Uh, this is an incredible story, but my local repairman guy was called to a school that was throwing out their instruments. And when he got there, he literally found an instrument exactly like this in the dumpster. Okay, this is the very first double horn made. It's, it's quite valuable for that reason. And he repaired it and I, I played it. It was, it was an interesting horn. Eventually they got rid of the, the double change valve and just went with a single which is mechanically a lot easier to play. Here's a typical French 
horn from the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, a Rao, Rao horn. Uh, this is the kind of horn Dennis Brain played on until he switched to a German horn. And an interesting Schmid horn, uh, Schmidt, I should say, C.F. Schmidt. And you, you know, most of those horns have a piston thumb valve and this one does, but they somehow attached a lever to it. So it's ergonomically a lot easier to play. Now at that point, you know, we're, we're kind of into the, the 20th century and to me, it's the horn was kind of finished like a hundred years ago. All everything since then has just been some minute refinements. You know, the German style horn absolutely won out because that that French horn that I showed you that was being played in France and also in England, probably up until the 1940s, 50s, and that maybe even later. I someone can correct me on this, but eventually the German style won out, and we are all playing German horns. They may have lost two world wars, but they absolutely won the horn wars. So getting back to why, why is it called the French horn? We talked about Count Spork and he was incredibly impressed with the horn and brought it back, but they still didn't call it the French horn in Germany. They, they were calling it that in England. And we don't know how long they were calling it that in England, but I'll show you an interesting business card. This is from 1699, and it's by the uh, instrument maker uh, William Bull, I believe this was his name. All sorts of trumpets and kettle drums, French horns, and he's got two Fs on that. And he's not having to explain it. If it was some novel instrument that they just named it that, uh, he would have probably you know, said something, but people knew what the French horn was. That was in 1699. They'd probably been using that term for uh, decades, maybe longer. So when the International Horn Society said in 1971, we should change the name and not call it French horn at all. We should only call it horns. You know, I, I just have a problem with that. I don't, I don't think that's realistic. The, the general public, which is 99% of the people we meet, uh, they, they call it the French horn. So when I'm, I'm out, someone asks me what I do for a living. I, I don't go with a horn thing. I just go cut to the chase. I play the French horn. And of course, for a horn conference, for the program notes in a, in a book or even in orchestra scores, yeah, we all know what a horn is. So we can drop the French part there and just call it horn. But it, it really is kind of a shorthand in the same way that calling cello a cello instead of a violoncello, which is its full name. It, you know, it's, it's a little confusing, horns, a generic term. So anyway, uh, on that note, I think I've sort of answered my question that I posed at the beginning. Are there any questions? I, I, I don't see it in this open question thing and I, I'm not sure where the chat is. Let me see if I can go back to the chat. I'll stop sharing here. Okay, interesting. Someone says hot take in English. French means fancy. I like that. Nice. Any idea when the jump from bone wood to metal instrument was made? Well, as I was saying that the, the Romans had figured out metal and even the Egyptians, you know, they had metal horns. So that technology was, was lost sometime in the dark ages and it came back at the beginning of the Renaissance. Some point in there, late 1500s, 1500s, 1600s. Was Lohengrin originally played with mixed hand techniques? Uh, I, I, you're, you're, I, I think you, you mean, it, would they play the whole thing on one uh, pitched horn and use uh, hand technique? I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I really don't know. I think it was written for valve horn, and but maybe not everyone had a valve horn, so they did have to use that, that uh, technique. Um, any other questions on here? Yeah, valves are likely. Yeah, exactly, I, I agree. Okay. Many references to the 
F horn. Uh, I'm not sure what is the what is the question on that. Okay. Well, uh, I think we're running out of time here. If there's any other questions, please uh, type them in the chat or in the uh, Q&A box. Anyway, it was really awesome being here and this, this whole workshop is an awesome thing. I'm looking forward to the further events, the recitals and, and the uh, panels. So thanks a lot and hope to see all of you. <laughs>